Check, check, one, two. See if it's coming through. Good morning, everybody online. We're doing a sound check here. And if you're tuning in, I uh, would love to see you. All right. Hang out. We'll see you soon.
Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope Vineyard Church. Great to see you here in person, online. We welcome you. Say hello in the comments below. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, welcome other people if you're online. If you're in person, feel free to get online as well on the Facebook feed and interact with people as we gather together. Um, my name is Jim Wood. My wife, Dee, Dee and I are the pastors here at Hope Vineyard Church, and, and it's a joy to be able to gather today. Um, we needed boats to get here today with all the rain that we're getting, but uh, that's okay. That's okay. We're, we're good, and I hope you're good right where you are. I'm wearing my Bears jersey today because they play the Super Bowl champs later, and I think they probably need every bit of help that they can get. So hopefully, hopefully this is what puts them over the edge today, right? They beat the Buccaneers. We'll see. I doubt it, but we'll see. Um, hey, if you have never liked us on Facebook or if you don't follow us on Instagram, if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, then what you doing? Get that stuff done. Try and get it figured out. Um, and you can do that. It's, a great, it's the best way, really, to stay connected and uh, to be able to share uh, your, your um, participation in the church with all those, those forms of social media. We're just glad that you're doing it. Um, I think that's it for today. Uh, I'm going to welcome Dee Dee up here. She's going to be sharing a bit today. So as she comes up, um, encourage her and, uh, you know, give her a little clap emoji if you're online or if you're in person here, just go ahead and clap as she comes up. There we go. All right. See you. Good morning, everybody. Huh. Well, I've been pressing in to um, becoming more loving. Now, I know that you hear that a lot, and um, and so you've heard it quite a bit in the messages that I've been given. But it's because of, of a real great desire to really figure out what love is and how to love well. Um, I've also been trying to experiment and experience the energy and, and how being loving transforms my, like, how I feel inside. So whether, I mean, some people think it might sound new agey to talk about energy. I, I don't. I think it's how it sounds kind of science-y. But um, that said, I know that when I am expressing love, I feel more positive and like I have more energy and when I am experiencing and expressing um, like anger or hate or shame or um, despondency there's a sense of negative energy and so I'm really just paying attention to how my energy or how I'm experiencing energy during love and how um, others experience me during love. I know I was talking about, um, I, I was uh, talking, I was describing the energy that a friend of mine has because she's very positive and that I have to sometimes like watch how I'm um, expressing myself because I don't want to get in the habit of, of being complainy, you know, like if I'm just venting or something, um, because if I take it too far, then I start taking from that energy. And so it's just, I've just been mindful about like how, th how the experience of love and being at peace um, really does it affect the atmosphere around or like within me and, and around me and um, how it can impact others. So I've actually been asking God to show me more about more about this. And so I think today's message is actually coming in answer to that those questions I'm asking God about how to love more and like the impact it has, um, what I need to understand or embrace about love in order to to move forward in this. And, I, and I, as you know, we've from time to time go back to doing the liturgical calendar, which is like the scriptures that have already been picked and the, and the great majority of, of churches out there will actually preach over those scriptures each week. And so sometimes we will go ahead and, and join in doing that. And so as I was asking these questions and reading the scriptures for this week, I feel like I was kind of highlighting, you know, like another, um, 
facet of this understanding of his love. So today we're going to consider the hope and freedom we can experience as we are within and remember and, and um, can envelop ourself, ourselves in um, God's love. So before we get started, I'll pray. Father, I thank you that you're here. I thank you that you have been forming this message. Lord, I thank you that you've, you've given it long ago, and, and there's just different ways where you prick our spirit and you say, hey, pay attention to this, remember this. And so, Lord, as we open our hearts to come into this remembering of your love, we ask that you will prepare our, our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears to see and hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, our main text is from Jeremiah 31, 7 through 9. And in this text, Jeremiah is talking about a, a time when God's going to call um, his people back to Israel. Now, what's interesting about this text or about this, this um, you know, part of Jeremiah's prophecy is that Jeremiah actually was a prophet um, before Isaiah, and he was a prophet that was prophesying after the, after the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel um, and before the destruction um, and exile of the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, when we talk about the northern kingdom of Israel, that's the, the ten tribes that never really came back. They, they, um, the, that part of, of Israel was never fully restored in um, biblical context. And the, the southern kingdom of Judah is what we most remember because the, it's the people from the southern kingdom of Judah that eventually did return from exile. But this is prior to there even being an, uh, an exile. Um, the Assyrians had attacked and, and um, destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, and they were kind of pressing in on the southern kingdom of Judah, but that hadn't even happened, you know, like they, they hadn't destro been destroyed yet. And later the Babylonians would press in on them, and eventually they would go into exile. So Jeremiah is a prophet who, for the most part of his prophecies, is prophesying doom and gloom. And he's just saying, you know, like, you saw what happened in, in the northern kingdom. It's going to happen here. You know, you, you, and God's mad, and you, you need to turn your ways. And, and because the Old Testament prophets um, assigned God's anger and wrath for bad things that would happen to Israel, they, um, Jeremiah thought that if he would, like, say, you know, like, turn from this, turn back to God, stop sinning, stop um, doing your um, idol worship. You know, this is, when this all comes down, it's like because you've all turned from God. But then in this section of Jeremiah 31, he does talk about a time after it's all been destroyed when God will call back his people. And so this would be a, a strange prophecy to be understood at that time, but those who, would, who had been in tune with God and, and could, you know, probably were feeling this anxiety, could hope, um, find some hope in the fact that no matter what happened to God's people, he would, he would still be with them and save them and call them back at some point. So I'm going to read just a section of Jeremiah 31. And we can um, just imagine, like, the people who might be fraught with anxiety and who were hearing all of the doom and gloom being um, preached by Jeremiah. And then also right in this middle of it, be, being told, but, but God's going to call you back. It's, it's going to be okay. And so here we start in verse 7, Jeremiah 31, verses 7 and 9. It says, Thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts of, for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O God, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind, the lame, those with child, those in labor, together. And so there's, um, and that, he specifically names those because those would be people who would normally be hindered 
from, um, especially through the law or in the society, those would be, be people who would be a hindrance, a burden, um, people who couldn't get there on his own, their own, and yet God's bringing them back. And included on those who couldn't get there on their own, you have those who are heavy with um, with child or those who are in labor, which means that there's there's a promise to come even after this. And so you have the symbolism of those that list of people who, who can't get there on their own, but there's going to be a new birth in it all as well. A great company they shall return here. With, we, with weeping they shall come. With consolations I will lead them back. And so this, in, the, in this case, it's weeping for joy that they're going to be returning to God. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they will not stumble. And so these people would be coming largely from desert lands. And so by God bringing them back along paths of water means that he's going to provide for them along the way. He's going to give them them bricks of water and um and when we hear you know that's n his water and god's provision and and um that's all symbolism of of refreshing from god and provision for it from him for i have become a father to israel and ephraim is my firstborn and that again talks about relationship and so it's not um it it means that if if god is the father then they have a, a status. They have a status within God, um, within that relationship. And so it's a promise of this restored relationship and, and bringing them back. So God knows where they were. He didn't leave them then, and he's bringing them back. And it's a promise to the people. And toward the end of um, chapter 31 or this, or this section about talking about this new time, he... Um, Starting in verses, verse 31 through 34, it says, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people, and they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. And so in Jeremiah was actually the first part of the um, section of the Bible or the book of the Bible where they um, started talking about this new covenant. And Isaiah, a couple hundred years later, will pick that up, and he has great poetry, and will really talk about this, this day of the Lord and this time when um, you know, like God brings people back. And, and there's both an idea of a, a political, you know, we'll get to be in charge then, and a sense of, of utopia. The, um, in, in Isaiah, it talks about the lion laying down with the lamb, and there's this... this um, peace and utopia and yet the new testament writers um understood like were looking back on the old testament and god was highlighting things that they thought were pointing to the answer being in jesus and in mark um mark quotes jesus as saying um this says in mark 10 46 to 50 nope in mark uh, 14 24 it says this is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for many he said he said to them and so marks um and several of the other new testament writers are talking about this covenant that is made in jesus so i'm going to stop right here and and let's look at the images that we're we've already talked about we've we've talked about this this old testament image of god um bringing his people back into relationship with himself and leading them along that way and, and that the joy and the gladness that would come along with this and then we're considering that this is a time that's been fulfilled in Jesus and and we can con we can use language like kingdom language the kingdom has come um, a new covenant has been made and we know that that's marked by by love and Jesus's messages about loving one another and loving each um, ourselves and loving God. And so we 
we can hold on to those things. And now I want to read a story that doesn't specifically talk about the new covenant or um, this, this new time, but it's a story in, um, in Mark that was also part of the liturgical calendar that kind of we can use symbolically because here this is a story about um, a man being physically healed of blindness, but because the um, Bible can also be used allegorically and can also be used symbolically, I'm going to, s I'm going to um, allow it to say for us today about God open, opening our, the eyes of our heart. And so where its original intent was not about that, because that's been our prayer to learn to love better, I felt like the Lord was saying we could, like, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying um, that this is a really good um, symbolism for us today. So this story is Mark 10, 46 to 52. And it says, Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho, and he and his disciples and a, and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, were leaving Jericho, sorry, as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting on the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he, Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but they cried out, but he cried out even more loudly, um, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Now, I use that story because if that's what um, the cry of our heart is, we can be assured that Jesus will answer us the same way. When we say, Jesus, um, like, have mercy on us, show us, teach us, and he says, what do you want? We can say, I want to see. I want to see again. I want to see. And so... Um, we know that that is also God's will because over and over again in the New Testament, Jesus says, let those have eyes, let them see, let those have ears, let them hear. And so he wants us to see and understand him. And I like this story because I can see myself in it. Because I can see myself sometimes desperate to see what God is doing, to understand what he's, what, what he's saying, what he's wanting, what he's asking of me to do. I want to see his love for me, and I want to see his love for others, and I want to see how I sometime intersect, or somehow intersect that. And so for us this morning, it's a great picture for us calling out to Jesus and saying, have mercy on us, because in his mercy, in his love for us, he can reveal more of himself. Other New Testament writers talk about um, the new t the new covenant that comes through Jesus. Now, again, when when we're looking at the New Testament writers, and when we t use words like the new covenant or the Son of God or um, the the Day of the Lord, all of those were were um, was were language that was used in the Old Testament to talk about this new day when God would do something different with His people, and the New Testament writers not only showed that that God like changed the heart of the the um, Jewish people who had eyes to see and ears to hear, hear, but they included the Gentiles. And again, it was saying all peoples, that, that God's message, his love, was for all peoples. And we didn't have to say to someone, I, I liked that part of, um, J of Jeremiah 31 because it really kind of took the excuse that a lot of people use for showing um, preference for Christians because it wasn't like um, in in that scripture at least it didn't seem like there was like 
ins and outs. It wasn't like you're not going to say you're not going to have to say to your neighbor or your brother, well, you should know God because it was like because everybody would know him. Well, everybody would know him, not necessarily because of our good theology or the signs we hold up or the posters we make. People will know him because he is love. And when we live in love, then then they will know him. And so in Second Corinthians uh, 3, 6 to 18, Paul writes this about the, the new covenant. And this um, new covenant would be an umbre- uh, umbrella language for when we have relationship with Jesus. So we could say, who, um, it starts mid-sentence, but it says, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. So we can, we can use that language, new covenant, and think um, to be ministers of the love of Jesus, the kind of love that Jesus shows, right? So we can be competent ministers of the kind of love that Jesus shows. Not by the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And he's talking about the letter of the law, the rules, you must do this, you must do that. But the spirit gives life, which is love, like when we're walking in love, right? Um, now, if the ministry of death chiseled in letters on a stone tablets came in glory so the people of Israel could not gaze at Moses' face because of the glory of his face, a glory now set aside, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit come in glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, which was the law, um, much more does the ministry of, of justification abound in glory. Indeed, what once had glory has lost its glory because of the greater glory. For if what was set aside came through glory, much more has the pertinent, much more has the permanent come in glory. Since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they're reading of the Old Testament, the same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to the very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. So they could have played a game with the amount of times uh, glory was said in that text. But if you think of it, he's saying that what the Old Testament couldn't do um, because people couldn't keep it, Jesus could do because of um, because he did it all. So it wasn't. And, and so we have this message of Jesus doing it all, um, which the mess um, Jesus would have done it all, whatever they uh, everything he did in order for us to see God's love in order for us to be brought in in order for us to experience this this status in the the benefits of of being children of God and so we have that message to share when we are talking in that spirit there's freedom and so like I was talking about um this energy or the sense or the the feeling of the atmosphere when we are best walking out love people who experience or both both who we both we when we are reminded of this love that God has for us and the others with whom we interact can experience this freedom and this 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 gladness that comes from being in the presence of love so if we today I'm trying to um, like move a little bit forward and say, well, how do we apply this understanding of God's love in the middle of times? So we're in the middle of times, meaning we don't know what's going on around the world. We can't hold on to everything being the same forever. We certainly be like would have never imagined being in a pandemic. We you know, like I could would have never in my life 
time imagined the whole like our democratic system um like possibly falling apart um i like there's a there can be like a lot of unrest now we can also imagine what it's like when we're in the middle of things you know like the society feeling comfortable but we're experiencing personal unrest maybe we are afraid or maybe we are sad or maybe we are still a people group that is still largely oppressed um over last summer, I studied quite a bit of, of um, like the theology in the Black Church and some of the some of the spiritual songs that were written during the times of slavery. And it's for most of us, I'm, I'm assuming all of us really um, here at least. It would be we we have no idea what it would be like to f truly be oppressed. When, when we have people thinking, you know, it's oppressive to, to ask people to put on masks, we have no idea what it would actually be to actually be oppressed. And yet, um, when, we, when, we underst when we look at how people who were truly oppressed, and we can all agree that slavery was oppressive, we can, we can look at when people were truly oppressed, how they could read these scriptures and be still at a time of despair. They couldn't, they, you know, they wouldn't think like, you know, yeah, I got my way today and now everything's okay. They would, th every day of their life and their parents' life and the parents' life before them was lived under oppression. And so they could identify probably m more largely than, than we can today of a people group who would have to hold on to the hope of a future when God made things right, and yet they would they could they could sing about that holding on. They would gather in 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 both lament and hope, sing and hold on to God. It's easy to hold on to God in when we like used to feel bad about you know what we did or how we looked, and now we don't, and now we feel like God freed us, and and that was. Um, you know, like saved us from oppression, and that's true. We, we're, we, many of us have been saved from spiritual oppression, and that's an awesome um, symbolism. But what I get, what I'm, what I gain hope for from is understanding that the, this truth of God's love is not only true when, when we're just having a bad day. It's also true when there are real um real oppression occurring and should we ever face that again we can look to the past and say but but people were able to hold on and i'm going to be able to hold on too and when i do struggle in my own spiritual oppression of grief and um anger or frustration or not seeing the kingdom come when the way i want to i can actually look into people um, groups who have struggled far worse than I have and said, but God, you are the God of hope for them. And so you can be the God of hope for me. Um, I've also in the past have read about missionaries or martyrs, and it is so interesting to see the pressing that comes from the world um, that presses us into God and the fruit of love that comes out of that pressing into God. Um, I don't have time right now to go into like the love people had for their enemies or any of that, but it's, it was very interesting just to see that that God does you know, like the stories of how God doesn't abandon people in the midst of struggle. So how do we apply this understanding to our own lives right now today? Well, um, uh, corporately. We're becoming a church that reveals God's love. And that's different than a church that reveals God's laws, right? We're becoming a church that reveals what love looks like in the form of embrace and acceptance and inclusion and, and seeing what people, I mean, introducing people to love so that love can do a work within them. Um, we are also like i feel like we're we're pregnant with this um what's what happens because of that 
like as God leads us back into this love, we are like those in labor, and there's something that's coming that's being birthed out of the freedom that that love brings. And I don't know what it is, and um, but I'm excited for it. We also are a people who can hope for the return of gladness, but also know that with the new coming of the new covenant, gladness lives inside of us. And so we can have our own personal struggles and, uh, and experience the struggles within society, and yet we can, we can hold on to the spirit of love that lives in us that can, give, that can remind us of the love that's always been there. Now, I've talked time and again about um, having a heart and a, and a desire to minister to those who have experienced ritual abuse or organized group abuse, and, and this is an extreme type of abuse. And so I'm, when I'm not learning about theology or history or, or politics or psychology, I'm also reading um, stories of survivors. And I came across this week about a, um, a story from a survivor who was, um, I didn't write her name. Her name was Elisa E., I think. And, um, and, and she, had, she has had and, and continues to have abuse that, that none of us could ever imagine. And what she attributes to, to her daily ability to go on is her um, calling on what she calls benevolent, unconditional, creative love. Now, she doesn't call herself a Christian because that was a type of a belief system that was used against her in a, in a what, it's a, like a twist of a belief system that is, that makes um, normal expressions of religion very negative. But because we know that God is love, and um, and I know in her story she's ex she's experiencing the kind of love that God loves. I know that when she's um, talking about love, I can I can know it's the same love that I'm talking about when I talk about God's love. And here's what she does when she is like every day because every day she's experiencing struggle. And and this is a language that she uses in remembering to call on and enter um, this love. And because we do believe that this love for us comes from Jesus, I want to read it because it was so profound to me that I think I don't want to, I'm not changing the way she sees it, but I'm using um, her view of love to, for me to see it differently. And she says this, she says what prayer is for her, and she says um, that, Every day she does this. She just says, benevolent, unconditional, creative love infuses us from within, surrounding us in benevolent love, benevolent light, and benevolent safety. Day and night, indoors and out, resting and awake, preventing malevolence, which is the evil of the world, which we also experience um, in various degrees, from accessing me. In any way, known or unknown to us, in body, mind, soul, or spirit, now and ever again, I exist in benevolent love, from this moment forward. And so, and she describes this love as, as not having judgment and, has, and um, that is full of acceptance and that it's a remembering of who she is and in, within this love. And if I um, apply those kind of thoughts to the kind of love that we look at when we are included as part of God's family, when he has led us along the way this whole time, when this new covenant has been made with, with, um, for because of Jesus that says we are all his children and I am accepted and loved um, and assured by him because of the Holy Spirit in me, then I can um, call on that when I am asking God to show me other things. Now, I've, I've begun to pray since I just read this this week, but I've been just, um, even in this week, I've, I've been able to apply this kind of love. Like, um, 
And like I look at it, you know, like I, I study policy and I pay attention to what's going on in, in policy and politics. And the reason I care about politics, which I really didn't used to before, but the reason I care about politics is because politics has to do with policies and policies have to do with the way people are treated. And so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but when I, when I look at um, when I look at the policies that I am for or against, I'm able to weigh that with how people are treated. And if Jesus was one of those people who was being treated one way or the other, then would, would, would I be okay with those policies? Um, I also, and that's easy for me, like social justice, that's easy for me. What's a little bit more difficult for me is treating others like they deserve love. And this, I've been, you know, it's, it's, we, we can do it in like broad sc scope. It says like if somebody comes into the church, don't give them the, like, don't give them the worst seats, give them the best seats. I can do that. But when it has to do with like my money or time or resources, and I, I can get caught in um, a, a scale like, well, this person deserves it more than this person. This is different than having a boundary for protection. It really has to do with like, well, I don't think, you know, like these, I don't want to do that. And we, we see that in, in different, you know, it, it, we're conditioned to do this. There's memes that say, like, why should an, an, an illegal person get this? And in fact, they'll just de dehumanize it and say illegals shouldn't get this, but veterans should, or, or you know, like prisoners shouldn't get this, but, you know, like our police should. You know, like that's, that has to, do, there's status in, in deserving and judgment that is being made that is outside of the kingdom of God. The, the kingdom of the world does that. We, we decide somebody, if they're productive, then they deserve more. If they might be, like, it was it's propaganda. Even in the 80s, when people started to be calling, um, called welfare queens, that was propaganda to dehumanize people and, 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 and make us believe, well, some people deserve things and some people don't deserve things. And, and for me, um, I will, I can do that. I can think, well, no, I'm just not going to love in the way I should because of that. And this week, I have had to really um, challenge that and say, I am not loving like Jesus with this unconditional, benevolent, creative love if I determine I'm going to, you know, like give you the consequence for your actions. Um, and, and that's different than boundary setting. It has to do with with resources that God gives us that are to be to given to others. Um, and then there's the th idea of, of love and love energy and praying for myself and others. And this, yesterday I had an experience, I, I struggle with anxiety anyway, and something didn't go my way. And, and I would typically just lump it up with other things that didn't go my way and think, well, no, this always happens. This isn't fair. This isn't right. You're like, something's against me, whatever. And, and I was able to say, but I am loved. And I just like, like, like stopped those thoughts of how wrong it was that this was going on or, or you know, like what should have been happening and able to really um, rest in, but I am loved. And I read this whole person's story in, in two books, the, the one who talked about the benevolent, unconditional, creative love. What she has going in her life is way worse than me not getting my way in some, you know, like right away in some circumstance yesterday. And I'm thinking, if that brings comfort to her, then how come I can't come into this love and just rest? And I did. I was able to really not go where my mind normally goes. And I also know that when I, I've started praying um, love for others, because I know that there's a thing that says that, that um, there's a cord that binds us in Christian love. And, and I know that somehow we're connected when we love like Jesus toward others. And so as much as I want to pray my way for others and that everything, you know, God will do everything I want in their life, I've started just saying, God, send your love there. Send your love. And if, it, if there is energy, if there is a difference in the atmosphere, 
um, around me when I pray, then I'm asking for there to be a difference of, of atmosphere around them when they pray. And that more, more of God's will and God's kingdom can come in their circumstance because I have changed that atmosphere. So even in the middle, even before rescue, even in the face of disaster, for us it is God who reminds us of his love. And I'm just going to read Jeremiah 31, 7 through 9 again, and allow him to take us and lead us and, and to the place where we remember just how loved we are. Sing aloud with gladness, O Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of nations. Proclaim and give praise and say, Save, O God, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim his, is my firstborn. I see us as individuals and as a church, and really as the world, scooped up in love. And I hope that, that you can go with that today and demonstrate it in those you meet this week. Father, thank you for um, your words and your hope in your goodness, and that we can truly hold on to you no matter what we face, and that we can truly offer that love to others because you have put it in us, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. As we move into this time of worship, uh, let's begin by declaring together out loud, if you're at home, do it out loud. If in, in person here, uh, we pray this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, let's worship by lifting our voices and our hearts and uh, our time together. Feel free to spread out and sing. Here I'm standing with the rain on my face. Finding here such unusual grace, I'm waiting here, standing where the mercy falls. I once was blind, but now I can see. My ears are open, finding faith to believe. I'm waiting here. Right. 
say to the fearful heart, our God is coming, our God is here. Every breath that I am able, I will see the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. Every breath that I am able, I will see the goodness of God. Cause your goodness is running out, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running out, it's running out.
I just have to say that Jim did a really, or that they, whoever, did, did a really good job on um, both Jim and uh, Emma did a good job picking the songs this morning, because I changed my message this morning. I was sick yesterday, so I didn't really get a work on the message, and then I said it was going to be about something, and then, like, texted him about 8.30 this morning and said it's going to be something else, um, and, the, and the songs went perfectly, didn't they? It's just amazing. I just I love it when that happens because it just means that God is just speaking to us in so many different ways, and He's getting in. He's like, well, you know, if if you if you didn't hear it in the message, you can hear it in the song. You know, like it's just awesome. Or if you did hear it, and then it could be reinforced in the song. So I just I just thank you, Lord, that you do kind of put things on our heart and, and orchestrate um, the things that you are teaching us. Lord, you're leading us by these brooks of water so that we can be nourished, so we can find rest, so we can, um, so your provision and your care for us can be confirmed. Lord, whether we are struggling and in the midst of struggle or anticipating struggle, we have a, a, a foundation in you. We have a status as your child. We have 
um, the atmosphere of love that you provide that we can be wrapped in. And Lord, it's, it's here that we want to stay. And so, Lord, we ask that you go with us, loving us and reminding us of your love this week. And that um, you'll remind us to let our words and our attitudes and our actions and our priorities to flow out of this love that you have for not only us, but for the whole world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. We wish you well. If you have any prayer requests, anybody here, raise your hand. And we'll make sure that we just surround you and pray for you. If you're up, up, if you're online, you can either put them in the comments or message us directly. And we'll make sure that we pray for you and that we um, your prayer gets on the caring prayer letter um, that we send out. And if you want to be part of that, send your email and we'll, we'll uh, include you in the email. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.